Hi everybody. I hope you're enjoying Lightbox Expo. I am Bill Pressing, author of Lucky Boy Tempting Fate, a new 80-page graphic novel that I have been working on for many, many years. In this talk, I will take you through my creative process for making this book. But first, I will introduce to you the premise and characters so that you can be familiar with them. The age of men is over. Approximately 1,000 years after the bomb scorched the surface of the planet, the world has begun to recover from a millennia of human abuse. In the area that was once known as Tokyo, sea creatures have evolved to walk on land and tribes of robots live in optimal compatibility with the lush jungles that have grown from the rubble of humanity. All that remains of a once mighty civilization are seven heavenly scientists and one lucky boy. The thing is, he missed his window. He was young and handsome once, but now it's too late. He's too old to be attractive to anyone. A massive aunt with 80 years worth of frustration pent up in his loins like hot magma, the old hermit is the last man on earth. Using every last ounce of his cunning and every last drop of his ingenuity, he will stop at nothing to attain that which fate has so mercilessly robbed from him. The opportunity to repopulate the globe with several highly dateable women. Such as Zoe. Like anyone who has taken sole responsibility for the fate of the human race, Zoe often struggles to find me time. A brilliant archaeologist and a devoted leader, Zoe's commitment to her fellow women is almost as exhausting as her ceaseless quest to restore civilization to its former glory. As God made man in his own image, so too does Lola desire to pay tribute to herself, only in plant form. All at once a mad botanist, a staunch naturalist, and a flagrant nudist, Lola has a deep communion with the chlorophyll set, and all the vanity of a prized daisy under the gazing sun. Leave it to a zoologist to place all her faith in natural selection. As elegant and deadly as Mother Nature herself, Vixen believes that men blew their chance and should remain extinct. In addition to her ongoing efforts to communicate with all manner of beasts, she is also determined to find a way for women to reproduce asexually. With a mind as bubbly as the sulfuric acid in her beakers, Chica is a chemist with affinity for human fluids. Light, breezy, and accident-prone, she lives to concoct explosive new formulas. Lately, she's been fixated on extracting vital DNA from the old, her the, the old hermit, by any means necessary. Except for the obvious one, come on people. One a theoretical physicist and the other a practical physicist, Tala and Bala are two sides of the same story. Tala is a wellspring of innovation with an overactive imagination, while Bala is all straight lines of practical solutions. Together they are a paradox of compatibility, a powerhouse of ingenuity and application. Who needs people when you have the ceaselessly crashing waves upon the shores of our, your own personal oblivion? A marine biologist with a nagging sense that humanity's last days are at hand, Kai just wants to ride it out, surfing and wading in the tide pools of her own existential listlessness. Then appearing out of nowhere comes Lucky, who wants a two whole sandwiches for breakfast. He enjoys disrupting trails of ants. One time, he heard a loud noise coming from the jungle. His favorite color is green. His favorite smell is shampoo. Uh, Lucky's least favorite feeling is confusion. He wants food, but he gets tired of chewing sometimes. I'd like to tell you a bit more about myself for a moment. Yes, yes. This is an actual photograph of me and my son in real life. Look, can't tell here, but I actually love to make comics. Big surprise. But professionally, I work in feature animation, so Lucky Boy is a passion project that I've been working on bit by bit for a very, very long time. 
Since I'm used to working in feature animation, I used a similar process to go through to create this comic. It all started way back in 2002 or 2003. Can't really remember anymore. Here is the initial point of inspiration. So when we were dating, uh, my wife, who was at that point my girlfriend, and I had broken up at one point early in our relationship. One night it gave me this terrible nightmare in which I was the last man on earth and she was the last woman. We were alone in a Miyazaki, Nausicaa-esque post-apocalyptic paradise, but she still didn't want anything to do with me. In spite of my depression, I thought this might make for a really funny comic book. So the next morning when I woke up, I did this drawing. Instead of one ex-girlfriend, why not a bunch of ladies who all live in the hollowed out shell of an ancient war robot? Why not? And instead of a schlubby, depressed last man on earth, how about an underage boy who's clueless to this amazing situation he's in? Like a, like a harem comedy version of, of Future Boy Conan. Or Gilligan's Island, for that matter. But I decided to make Lucky a cave boy instead, to contrast all these girls who I decided should be scientists, making him as dumb as possible and them as smart as possible. These are my first attempts at designing and defining these characters and what their science might be. I wanted each to specialize in a different science and their design to reflect that science, like this marine biologist, Surfer Girl. I also wanted to give each girl a unique ethnicity to support a rich diversity that the lucky boy should appreciate if only he were capable. I was heavily influenced by manga and anime at the time, like uh, Ranma One Half, Dragon Ball, and Cutie Honey. And I noticed there was this weird tradition of including diminutive elderly perverts in semi-villainous roles. I thought, hey, that could give, uh, give some conflict to this weird, this weird sex farce that I'm building. I think these are my earliest drawings of the old hermit from 2005, I'm guessing. As you can see, I liked Haposai from Ranma one half so much that I had a really hard time getting away from his design to create something of my own. I decided to put a pin in it at the time and move on to story development. Maybe I'd find his design there. The Rough Draft. I am a visual spatial thinker, so this is how I write my comics. Not with a script, but with a storyboard. I do thumbnail boards like this so I can road test ideas and iterate on them. I'm not worried about page layouts or dialogue yet. This is actually just the story workshopping phase. Uh, these are my very first story drawings for Lucky Boy. I was convinced that Lucky was my main character and um, really wanted to start the book with the scene of him lost at sea, then being wiped out by a giant wave. We time cut to the next morning to see the old hermit pestering the ladies, then catch up with Kai, the marine biologist who spots the mysterious cave boy adrift at sea. She rescues him, then brings him to the rest of the girls who resuscitate him. The old hermit finds out and is instantly jealous. No longer the last man on earth, he has competition. So I had a good engine to, gener to generate comedic situations now. An old hermit with, endlessly, with endless desires is perpetually jealous of an oblivious cave boy that the girls give all their attention to. Uh, this is just another pass. I, yeah, I, I kept iterating on the same stuff over and over. You know, I, I struggled to figure out where the story was going. It was then that my very good friend, the world-famous story guru, Ronnie Del Carmen, told me that my main character was not actually Lucky Boy, but in fact was the old perverted hermit. He's the main character? I thought, you gotta be kidding me. But the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. The hermit is in the same role and situation that I was in in that dream that I had. 
the very thing that inspired this thing in the first place. You know, I had I'd lost sight of my original intention. Making him the main character not only restores that, but it's also an opportunity to take a conceptually unappealing character and give the audience empathy for him. Suddenly, I had a main character who could grow and have an arc. Suddenly, I had a place to take the story. After that, I had a roadmap. And I thumbnailed like crazy. I started over and storyboarded the entire first pass of the book this way. This is my rough draft. I think it's very important to not worry too much about how good something is and just like vomit out a whole pass. Get it down. It's always easier to fix something that's broken than it is to start something that start to start with, with something that's perfect. I pitched these boards back to Ronnie, the Karma again, and a few other friends whose opinions I, I value greatly. And I got some really good feedback on how to improve the story for the next stage which is page layouts. So with my story firmly in place, save for some minor tweaks, it is safe to start turning my thumbnail storyboards into thumbnail layouts. First, I'll eliminate any panels that aren't essential to the story telling, sorry, for the storytelling, or combine panels if need be. I don't want to have too many panels because that will make more work for me to do later. Comics, in my opinion, should focus on the essential storytelling first, then only establish the special moments with nuance or drama. Whatever, you know, that moment needs. Uh, then I will take my essential boards and arrange them into a comic book page layout. I definitely don't ever get this right on the first try, believe me. Of course, sometimes I'll need to recompose the individual panels, partly because their shape changes, but also to compose the page as a whole in order to lead your eye properly from panel to panel. This is merely another example of adapting thumbnail storyboards into thumbnail layouts. Uh, the reason I keep these stages in all in thumbnail form is so that I don't wind up spending too much time on them. I'll continue to lay out the entire book this way. Having it in this form makes it readable and pitchable. So it's a great opportunity for more feedback, again, to improve it even more for the next pass. There's always these opportunities. Now that all that pesky story stuff is out of the way, I can finally start drawing the darn book. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I never, I never decided on what any of this stuff... Or even that old man is supposed to look like, did I? Yeah, so character design, another visual development is next. As you remember, this drawing was my starting point. I was pretty happy with most of these characters, for the most part, just needed to practice drawing them more and to start to find and define them more. Uh, these drawings are from 2009. I drew Zoe the most, I think. I started seeing her as the leader of the group and the main girl the story would focus on. She bears the weight of the responsibility of the group, so I wanted her to be strong She's also an archaeologist, so I incorporated elements of her science into her design, which helped add a nice uh, adventurer feel. As with all the girls, I did my best to caricature but still represent their ethnicities in a sensitive way. It's something I need to continuously work on, too. Um, I want them all to be uniquely defined. As with a lot of my 2009 designs, I realized I was making the girls too statuesque. Um, I updated them in 2010, 2011 to, to live in the same world as the short and cartoony Lucky Boy and the even shorter and even cartoonier Old Hermit. Back to 2009 for some exploration on Kai, the marine biologist. To help tie her to the sea, I wanted to give her a Polynesian look, but with an anime edge, hence the hair shape and color. I knew she'd be in the water a lot, so I designed for her both a dry look and a wet look. Thought it'd be fun to contrast the big fluffy hair. On to 2011 when I finalized her design and gave her a few alternate outfits. She's still the tallest of the group, even after I shortened her proportions to match the other characters. Here is some early exploration of Lola, the Brazilian botanist. 
And here is her final designs. I decided to simplify her hair, not only to make it easier to draw, but also to make it look like a single flower petal to help represent her science of uh, botany. For some reason, I found Chica, the chemist, really quickly. I guess she's in my wheelhouse already. Vixen took a little longer. I gave her a beehive at first for some reason. She's the wildest of the bunch, who's embraced nature the most. Uh, in spite of this, I played around with incorporating technology with her. Ultimately, I didn't really go that direction, but I did think it might be fun to give her some depth to have her be all prim and proper, you know, when she's not on the hunt. The character of Bala got split into twins. This is Bala, and this is Tala. They had uh, to physically look identical, but their personalities are polar opposites. Bala is a doer and Tala is a dreamer. It took a few tries, but eventually I landed on a good look for her, I think. Lucky Boy was a bit trickier for me. Uh, my early attempts were a bit awkward. I wanted his character to be gangly and awkward, and not the drawings themselves to be awkward, if you know what I mean. Lucky is a mute, primitive cave boy who needed to look like he was on the cusp of puberty. Believably too soon to have any interest in the girls yet. Uh, gangly but muscular did the trick, I thought. That along with uh, the blank, close-set eyes. I was definitely thinking about my favorite caveman, Ali Oop, when designing Lucky. But it wasn't until afterward that I realized I had combined him with Dennis the Menace's pal Joey. I just thought, I thought this was good, just saying. As for the old hermit, once I figured out that his beard could jut out breaking a silhouette, I knew I was onto something. That combined with the old flower sack trope, I was uh, able to finally finalize the guy. And here is my final lineup of the main cast. There were uh, many additional characters and environments that contribute to the world building as well. I'll cover some of those now. The idea of the post-apocalyptic world that Lucky Boy is set in is one in which all life on land was eradicated, leaving only the sea life to evolve into the new land creatures to replace them. Therefore, I had fun exploring which fish and sea life might make for fun land animals like this uh, coelacanth bulldog. And the cuddle bunny, a shape-shifting rabbit-like creature that evolved from a cuttlefish. Admittedly, though, creature design is not my strong point, and I am not ashamed to ask for help from an expert. The expert in question is my friend Sarah Dickin. I wanted her input in particular because she is the best at cute animals. Case in point, these adorable cuddle buns, have you ever seen anything this cute with a tentacle mouth? Huh? She also did some additional exploration on some other sea-inspired animal concepts, as you can see here. Here's how some of it worked out in the final product. In the end, I used a few of hers and a few of mine. There are a fair number of robots in Lucky Boy, I would say. The old hermit built this one as a companion before the girl showed up. Try not to blame him though, it had been a very long time and he couldn't really remember what a woman looked like anymore. Poor guy. Speaking of robots, here is a giant one. I knew I wanted the girls to live inside the remains of an ancient war robot, even though I knew we would only see the top half of it. I decided I wanted to design the entire thing. I imagined that the uh, time period pre-apocalypse, when the robot would have come from, would be some kind of mid-century retro future, so I looked at a bunch of classic car bumpers and grills for inspiration on, on it. Here's a couple of concepts for what that same robot would look like integrated into the post-apocalyptic landscape, making a nice home for our scientists. As for the old hermit, I wanted him to live isolated from the girls, but still as close as he could get. 
he takes up residence inside the severed hand of the very same giant robot, uh, which is still partly operational and aids in his snooping. Very handy for him. Okay, so now that all that stuff is finally done, I can actually start drawing the darn book. Uh, this part is actually pretty straightforward, in fact. Uh, so for starters, I took my thumbnail page layout and blew it up to the size that I'm going to do the real drawing and printed it out. Yes, I work physically. Uh, then I threw a sheet of paper on top and started drawing over the layout, either simply by seeing through the paper or by using a light box. Uh, once I am done with this, I'll throw another sheet of paper on top of that one and do the tight final drawing with color race pencil and Copic marker for shading. In this case, I saw room for improvement and made some changes. Uh, like instead of putting the robot on the top of a hill, I integrated it, integrated it into a volcanic rim to help give the book more of the tropical flavor that I was that I was going for. Here's an example of a page that didn't change that much. Um, I start with the layout, which I'm usually very specific with in my compositions and panel proportions at that stage, so that when I tighten the drawing for the rough drawing phase, I try to maintain those proportions as much as I can. Uh, I also like to add in rough dialogue at this phase to make sure it all works and is readable. Then for the tight drawing phase, I try to make the line as clean as possible. This is what will be seen as the final product when, when it's colored. I'll go tighter for this next example. FYI, word balloons are, in fact, a compositional, compositional element, so it's always good to get them in there at the layout stage. For my rough drawing phase, I was mostly focused on the character drawing. It wasn't really until the next tight phase where I spent a lot of effort embellishing the backgrounds as you can see here. The next phase of this project was definitely the most challenging. Lucky for me, I got a lot of help. The greatest boon I received on this project was this feature animation style color arc created for me by the incredibly talented Shelly Wan. It's basically a chart that lays out the color palettes for all the pages of the book in advance. I will try my best to explain it, it is a little complicated. Imagine a horizontal line drawn through these pairs of dots, like this. You know, so color palette on the top and a couple examples down on the bottom. Um, this would be page one, page two, page three, page four, so on and so forth. Uh, these pink dots represent the intensity of the scene. So the higher the dot is, the more intense that scene is, and the lower the dot, the less intense it is. Intensity is, in this case, is represented by the contrast of the color palette. So high intensity would result in a high contrast image and low intensity would result in a low contrast image. Uh, the white dots represent the emotional arc of the old hermit, our main character. So basically, the higher the dot is, the happier he is, an emotional high. The lower the dot is, the sadder he is, an emotional low for the character. These highs and lows are represented by color. In general, we represented good or happy feelings with warm or bright colors and sad or low feelings with cool or desaturated colors. This creates palettes that support any particular scene's unique combination of intensity and emotion. For instance, a highly intense scene where the character is in a low or dark place would result in a palette that's high in contrast with cool or desaturated colors. I tried to follow these rules as best to my ability when I colored the book. I wanted the color to live up to Shelley's intentions as much as possible. Now I will explain the actual process by which I applied all that color to the, uh, to the, to the pages. To show you, I'll use this test I did early on. It's a really good representation of how the whole book was colored. First, I take a scan of the tight finished pencils, bring it into Photoshop. Next, the flat is created by drawing over top of the drawing with the lasso tool and filling the selections with 
arbitrary but temporary colors. This process was done for the book by artists known as flatters. Uh, my flatters were Tina Avina, Karina Smith, and later Susan Cho. If it weren't for them, I'd still be working on this book. I owe you guys, believe me. Using Shelley's color arc for reference, the colorist fills the selections with the proper color and adds any additional rendering that may be needed. Uh, the book was colored by Shelley Wan, too, and Mindy Lee, Your Eco Ito, and myself. Okay, this is where things get a little tricky. So the color layer is placed on top of the art layer, and then the blending mode is set to either color or hue, depending on whichever one of those looks better. The result of the combination looks like this, colorizing the image. Next, we take a duplicate of that color layer that we used already and put it on top and set that one to multiply in its blending mode. And that's how we colored the whole book. Sounds easy. <laughs> in review of the process, it was not easy. We started with the original idea and inspiration. Explored story, characters, and concepts. Finalized story and design. Created comic book page layouts. Drew rough pencils. Drew final tight art. Colored it. Then lastly added the finalized dialogue and word balloons. Then off to the publisher and printer it went. And here it is. Lucky boy, tempting fate, or at least an advance preview copy of it. Feast your eyes! It's a nice, big, sturdy, hardcover book. A little over 10 by 13 inches. It has a spot gloss, as you can see. On a scuff-free matte lamination, uh, there will also be a limited edition of 250 copies that will feature this tipped-in book plate that will be signed and numbered, unlike this copy since I hadn't gotten around to it, to signing it yet. Uh, except for the book plate, this and the regular edition are exactly the same and feature the exact same 80 full color, fully illustrated pages. That's 70 pages of narrative story material and uh, an extra bonus character feature in the back. It printed beautifully. I could not be happier with this. Um, unfortunately, there have been some production delays and port delays, which seems par for the course nowadays, unfortunately. So unfortunately, the release date had to be pushed back by a couple of months. But uh, luckily, they are now available for pre-order from Stewarding Books. The regular edition is $30. 30 US dollars, and the limit edition is 50. Um, if you can't wait for this English language version, and or if you speak French, the French language version is actually available right now from Ankama Editions. So that is uh, stewardingbooks.com for the English version, and ankama-editions.com for the French one. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to find me online, you can at Bill Pressing Art on Facebook and Instagram. I hope you all enjoy the rest of Lightbox Expo and have a good one, everybody. Thanks.